Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus. I am the death metal guy flying solo this time. Uh, the black metal guy is sick, but I always assumed that I would probably do this piece as a solo venture anyway, so I guess the stars just sort of aligned this time. Over the course of Terminus uh, aging and developing as a podcast, uh, we've touched on a, a lot of different styles of music. Uh, throughout, you know, what we call uh, extreme music. Uh, the Black Metal guy has done some really good pieces on neo-folk, and he's also commented a lot on industrial and dark electronic music. And I've at least mentioned a few times of my other passions, and now we have the opportunity to, well, I was going to say talk about, but I guess this is sort of a one-way monologue, isn't it? Uh, anyway, to talk about power electronics. Uh, power electronics is a style of music that is very near and dear to my heart and, you know, has various connections into extreme metal through shared personnel or just sort of a shared interest in certain aesthetic features. Uh, I've been into this style since I was a teenager. Probably late high school, I stumbled across my first power electronics stuff and uh, I was immediately fascinated by it. Uh, you know, the ugliest potentials of industrial stuff, in, not industrial music itself, but industrial technique, had been practiced slightly in extreme metal. You know, if we're talking about sort of dark ambient and noise black metal experimentation by way of Abruptum or Havohej, or perhaps the sort of extreme GABA and Speedcore influences and stuff like the Berserker. I was always sort of intrigued by these sounds, but I had never really heard them in a rough and extreme enough format outside of metal to catch my ear until I heard Power Electronics. Describing Power Electronics to someone outside of it is difficult because it is an outgrowth of noise and industrial music, and industrial is probably second only to maybe hardcore in terms of a, a genre label that can mean completely different things to different people. Power Electronics is itself a form of harsh noise or industrial music, depending on how old you are and how you want to talk about it. And pinning down exactly what it is is pretty difficult. There's tendencies within the style. Uh, as opposed to regular harsh noise, it tends to be more driven by vocals, uh, maybe some sparse rhythms. Uh, there's an emphasis on certain methodologies of producing sound that isn't quite as everything in the kitchen sink as a lot of harsh noise is with all of its, uh, you know, contact mic experimentation. Power Electronics is a little bit more organized, a little bit more direct. You know, it, uh, it walks a thin line between the pure abstraction of harsh noise music and the more deliberate, considered quality of what a lot of us would think of as normal music. But I'd say really what differentiates power electronics, if we're being specific and we're being honest with ourselves, is the vibe and the aesthetics attached to it. Uh, it only makes sense that extreme metal people are drawn to power electronics, given a lot of its subject matter, uh, given its ruminations on serial murder and totalitarian politics and drug addiction and violence and perverse sexuality, uh, the sort of things that are frequently covered in extreme metal songs. But perhaps what makes power electronics distinct amongst all styles of music that fixate on those topics is its refusal to apologize. I think that that's a, a really crucial aspect of it. Power Electronics has never been so in the public view that there was any sort of mass cancellation attempt or, you know, desire to reform the genre from within to make its content more palatable. And I would say that any Power Electronics project that did apologize for its content would essentially cease to be Power Electronics. 
it's founded on the sort of strident art principles of modern artists and uh, early industrial experimenters from the UK in the 50s through the 70s. And it only grew out into a uh, properly established genre of music after a formalization of some of those techniques. But we have to keep in mind that this emerges from an art community that was not just attempting to be, but was ideologically fixated on the concept of transgression. And as a result, power electronics is perhaps the last genre of music out there that really doesn't care. I mean, I'm sure you can dig up some dusty old SoundCloud page, which has some, I don't know, uh, especially polite uh, neoliberal minded power electronics but let's face it that just doesn't matter power electronics is music for people who like bad things uh, on Terminus um, we've covered a lot of different kinds of music uh, with a lot of variation in content but we've always sort of had a personal policy not to apologize for anything that we cover and I want to extend that, especially to this episode, but I want to say more to the point that I enjoy power electronics for what it is, and I believe that the vast majority of its listeners do too, which is, I mean, perhaps as a sort of protest, perhaps as a sort of wry look at the underbelly of society, but is also fundamentally prurient in its fixation i like bad things i like to read about and watch and hear about uh, human suffering and cruelty and oppression and barbarism this is the point where most people would say that they like those things because it's a commentary on them or it's a warning away from them and there's a part of me in which that's true. But today we're not going to talk about that part. I like it because I like it. And I'm not really interested in convincing anyone if I'm a good guy or a bad guy. I like it and I'm fine with that. In terms of formative experiences beyond listening to, uh, you know, Power Electronics records in high school, uh, there are a couple that come to mind, so bear with me just this momentary trip down memory lane. So you get to learn a little bit about the death metal guy. Uh, f the first thing that I can remember really striking me was uh, when I was around 17. Uh, I had a buddy over hanging out at my house. Uh, he lived right down the road from me, but a little bit of a drive, and uh, his car was shot. So I picked him up, brought him to my place, and then at the end of the night took him back and then drove back to mine. Uh, at that point, I had one of those. Here's, a, here's one for the Zoomers in the audience. You might not be familiar with the, uh, cons the, the cassette uh, aux cable. <laughs> the aux cable attached to a blank cassette that you could plug into your iPod uh, when you weren't wealthy enough to have a car with Bluetooth, which I certainly wasn't at the time. Um, and at some point I had accidentally hit the eject button. And when you hit the eject button on one of those old car stereos, it just sort of resets your radio station when it defaults back. And this time it kicked me to a classical station on AM radio. Now, this was late. This was probably 3 in the morning, so whatever I was listening to stopped, and I just got this uh, blast of classical music in tinny, minimal uh, AM sound quality. And I was about to put the tape back in, but then at that moment I passed under a set of power lines, which naturally uh, added distortion and static to what I was listening to. And the piece that was playing, I assume, must have been some very, uh, some sort of very modernist Eastern European classical piece appropriate for night drives at three in the morning. You know, maybe not full Penderecki, but definitely more dissonant and strained. 
and the quality of listening to this sort of haunting, you know, ruined Soviet classical music against these waves of distortion that would rhythmically pulse as I would pass under sets of power lines, I found really fascinating. Uh, I believe that happened either shortly before or shortly after I started listening to power electronics, and I found it really fascinating. The second time was probably a couple years later, uh, involving the same friend, coincidentally. Uh, my friend had a grandmother who had dementia, and uh, in her younger years, she was a, a very talented pianist and singer. And my friend had a lot of old cassette tapes of her playing and singing where uh, he came to me to have them digitized. I was uh, the only guy in our friend group that had that set up. It wasn't quite as standard back in the day. Uh, so he came over to my place. We were just hanging out, having some drinks, and I started ripping these tapes. Uh, so I popped one in, hooked up all the cabling, and ran it through Audacity, and uh, I allowed it to live monitor back. And what I heard was so ghostly, you know. These these tapes were maybe C-120s. A tremendous number. must have been 40 to 60 of them, of hours of this woman singing and playing piano. But on tapes that hadn't been climate controlled or maintained you had uh, you had you know tape line you had distortion it seemed like flex of it were just coming apart like we were listening to the disintegration loops or something and uh that was another big moment for me listening to something that ghastly you know this this corruption of this otherwise pleasant or plaintive sound by these just gouts of like unnatural noise and ever since those two experiences and listening to power electronics a lot i've just kind of concluded that that is something specific that i look for you know this this high contrast these uh beautiful things being smashed by ugly things you know because the ugly thing at the end of the day always takes precedence in art it doesn't matter how many you know beautiful melodies you have one dark throne riff can bulldoze over the entire thing and taint it in a way that i find really fascinating and i think that's what power electronics is to me it's uh it's a box of tapes. It's, it's sifting through detritus and allowing the world around it to infect its sounds. You don't really think ordinarily how much noise you're listening to all day. The human brain is very good at tuning it out. But here, uh, just sitting here recording this in the evening in my apartment, I can hear the hum of my laptop CPU, I can hear the hum of my refrigerator in the corner, you know, the constant uh, moderate tinnitus that I experience is perpetually ringing in the background, that never stops. Throughout everything we experience, the, the soundtrack to our day-to-day -day lives is perpetual electronic interference. And I like the idea of how that might intersect with the darker parts of our lives. You know, the soundtrack to modern crime and modern violence and modern grotesquerie uh, is always filled with those electronic sounds. Cameras recording, audio distorting from high volume. Every horrible video you've ever seen on Live Leak doesn't come out crystal clear, and it shouldn't. So I think that maybe the best way to understand some of those things is by listening to Power Electronics. And I think that there's a, a potent, if abstract, ideology to Power Electronics. You know, it's... It's something about power, and it's something about modernity. But it's not looking backwards for a rescue, like extreme metal does so frequently. And while I appreciate that, there's something a lot more realistic 
and grounded and probable about the world that Power Electronics posits because I think we're already in it. So let's talk about some records. I should note before we get into the first review, or I, I don't even know what we're going to call these, probably not reviews, I don't even have notes written down, I'm just sort of speaking extemporaneously. Uh, it should be noted that the records that we're going to cover are favorites of mine, but not necessarily designed to be canonical power electronics records that you should definitely listen to. Uh, they're personal favorites, I enjoy them all a lot, but most of them I don't know where I would actually place in any sort of ranking. The first record we're going to cover, uh, I don't even know if I would call it in the top 50 power electronics records of all time, I don't even know if you would actually call it power electronics. It's a little bit too early for the big wave of power electronics that sort of starts up in the mid-80s and just progresses further and further from there. But I like it a lot, and I think that it's a really interesting record to ease you into this genre of music. I'm talking about Will by Hunting Lodge, released in 1983, which is appallingly early, given the intensity of some of its content. Now, power electronics as a term was theoretically coined by White House in 1982, but that's in the days of White House's early, uh, you know, sort of Dadaist harsh noise experimentation, you know, long before they would be fully formed, and long before the genre of power electronics would firmly congeal into a sort of shape that you could take hold of and describe. So Will itself may or may not be a power electronics record. It's got some very harsh moments and some intense vocal focus at times, but this is also very similar to maybe early Lust Mord or uh, some of the less extreme early recordings by Mersbau, of whom Masami Akita is actually featured on this record. This works in a gradient somewhere between minimal dark ambient to stuff comparable to what the UK scene had started to put out in the early 80s. But what ties it all together is its unusual, uh, very deeply indebted to the industrial scene proper mood. Something that is lost in a lot of newer power electronics is... Uh, patience. Um, the final record that we talk about today will maybe be the starting pistol for Power Electronics really losing a lot of its subtlety, but it's fully intact on this record. Will is a really good title. I really like uh, simple words with a lot of meanings. You know, yeah, art school 101, but I've still got a lot of time for that. You know, as a metalhead, you're probably thinking of the Nietzschean will to power when you hear that. You know, the idea of having a will or having a strong will or a weak will. But I, I like the fact, for this album's title at least, that it, it can also be a question. Will they or won't they? You know, it's, uh, it's uncertain. But there's also certainty in the inverted version of, version of that, you know, he will, I will. You know, even early on, Hunting Lodge had seized on the idea of power electronics being, in a large part, music about the imposition of will. You know, be that physical or political or cultural, there is a, a, a forcing of one's will upon another which is something that this record, even as abstract as it is, is sort of about in its own way. Describing the contents is difficult. Uh, with this review, as with all the others, I'm just going to have the record playing softly in the background. I think that's probably the best way to understand this music because you know, pulling samples from individual tracks like we do on the show typically just doesn't really work for this style of music. 
Uh, it's designed to work over time through repetition and as a sort of directed meditation on dark things. I guess if that, uh, if that seems reasonable and it's not too dismissive. But will is primarily defined by sort of minimal electronics, sometimes even techno or martial industrial adjacent rhythmic work, intense distortion like you might hear from White House or Sue Cliff Ugand, and all sorts of weird dark ambient stuff in the middle. We've got tracks that are minimal and droning, we have tracks that are explosive and aggressive. Overall, it's really varied. It's kind of impressive that these guys managed to get such a varied yet aesthetically unified collection of sounds through what I imagine involved a lot of free improvisation. Will is a record about preparation. Will, even at its most aggressive moments, doesn't fully explode. They're like skirmishes on the outskirts of a much bigger war. The suggestion comes not just through the music, but through the titles, which have already started to access some of the ideas that would congeal into sort of staples of the uh, power electronics subgenre. You know, the the suggestion of things like ice pick method, S and M operations. We are they, and later, you are of me. You know. These are song titles that suggest uh, violence, deviant sexuality, uh, sort of uh, oppressive, totalitarian political regimes. And in a very, mm, you know, post-war modernist art manner of the style, they approach this almost as though it's a sort of protest music. This is one of the few cases in uh, Power Electronics where I can say that I think the objective of this music is disapproval of its subject matter. It's certainly playing with the imagery and the sounds of this sort of uh, vicious exploitation, but I think it's uh, sort of fundamentally good-hearted. It's the last strains of the 1960s eking themselves out in the last few experimental hippies that still believed in the mission. But it's interesting how quickly it suggests what power electronics would turn into. You know, the fundamental problem whenever you're trying to make music that disapproves of bad things is, you know, you still want to make good music. So even if it's not your ideological intent, it's amazing how quickly Hunting Lodge can make some of these ideas sound pretty cool. You know, take the title track, Will. You know, it's a bleepy, bloopy, somewhat silly sort of early attempt at a, a noisy electronic music, the sort of thing that would be later perfected by groups like Cut Hands. But within it, you know, are the seeds of horror and sci-fi movie soundtracks of the 80s. Starship Troopers was, you know, a, a commentary and a parody. But those pulse rifles are pretty fucking cool, man, aren't they? Hunting Lodge as a project only did a couple more records after this, and they're much less listened to. I haven't heard them myself because I think Will really stands on its own. When you listen to Will, you know, and this is a versatile one, you can listen at home if you want to be in deep meditation to it. You can listen to it in your car sort of casually. You know, you get a nice shuffle effect off of how varied the tracks are from one another. And really just anywhere in between. Throw it on in a party and just get weird. You know, there's stuff that the normies will find kind of funny and kind of weird, and you can carve out your niche as, you know, the cool art guy at your local social function. But listening to Will puts you in an interesting sort of headspace, which is, again, I want to say that, that one of preparation. A lot of power electronics is about violence or about war or about deviant sexuality. It's about acts occurring. Will 
is about the preparation of those acts. You know, it gestures around the sides of its own content in a way that I typically find irritating. I like the sort of brazen aggression of extreme metal a little bit more you know, in most situations, but here I think it works. You know, we're not observing the blood and guts of the moment itself, but the sort of tense, ghostly, anxious moments prior. You know, Will really makes you think about, you know, groups of, you know, dangerous, ideologically driven young men who are preparing to do something terrible. And those terrible things probably include... All the subsets that are referred to on this record, the violence, the sexual deviance, and the oppression of a population. You know, the final track, Banishing Dirge, sends you out on a very cold tone, a sort of minimal drone track that suggests that this is the credits rolling before the movie really starts. All the rest of the records that I'm going to discuss on this episode are a lot more immediate and a lot more personal and a lot more emotive than this record is, but this one has a special place for me, I think, because of that coldness and remoteness. I think if you're a black metal guy, not to be confused with the black metal guy, you'll find something very <laughs> odd word to use, but approachable about this record. Uh, the Black Metal Guy on our main episodes often talks about how uh, black metal in general should be remote and inhuman. Power electronics conversely tends to be uh, not at all remote, but extremely close and extremely human. Just the most negative aspects and potentials of being human. But Hunting Lodge here has made a record that make something emotionally identifiable but still very cold and very removed so uh for all of you guys that are collecting black and white blearly xeroxed uh, limited to 50 dark ambient tapes that are side projects of your favorite artists uh you should check this one out i think that it'll have a lot to offer all right, so I opened the last segment by talking about how this, you know, none of these reviews were really intended to be a promotion of a specific record as Power Electronics canon, but this is the exception. I'm breaking the rule on the second review to say that Birdseed is, in my opinion, the best Power Electronics record of all time. Um, it's certainly the best White House record, and White House themselves are probably in, like, top five favorite bands ever for me. So I'm coming at this from a position of bias. But not even especially a lot, because I think there's a lot of people out there that would suggest that this is, bare minimum, the best White House record. Uh, and I think a lot still who would say that it's among the greatest of all time in the genre. White House started early, early, like beginning of 1980s, but honestly, I wouldn't recommend the vast majority of their 80s work. Um, White House were trading in a sort of extreme, uh, profane, transgressive, experimental noise territory, but the affiliated project Sucliff Jugend did it better than them at the time. So White House, even though they coined the term power electronics and are one of the seminal artists of the genre, really weren't worth a whole lot in their first decade of existence. But then, with the 90s, there was a pivot. And in the 2000s, and eventually in 2003 with Birdseed, that pivot was complete. Sukla Fugan and White House both traded in extreme, vulgar, profane, deliberately grotesque depictions of violence and deviant sexuality and any number of politically incorrect ideological potentials. But they started to split off a little bit later. Sutcliffe Yugen doubled down on the idea of being the ugliest, dirtiest, meanest guy in the pub, and White House kind of went in a different direction. 
White House to me has always been a fascinating project, both musically and ideologically. The members of the project were, in a sense, sort of closed-lipped on what they thought about any of their content. Um, and unlike a lot of other Power Electronics projects, White House was much more interested in the philosophical ramifications of all these sort of, like, dreary underbelly of society activities. Uh, they were interested in the culture that arose around them. You know, like good art students, they understood that they were reinforcing exactly the sort of things that they decried, or at least thought they were decrying, and turned their gaze more onto the process of making that art itself. To clarify, uh, what is a, a very abstract thing to explain. The opening track on Birdseed is Why You Never Became a Dancer, uh, which is a particularly infamous song, uh, essentially insulting a popular female modern artist uh, around London in the late 90s and early 2000s. Her name escapes me at the moment. It doesn't matter. I've checked out the source material. It's shit art. Uh, in two and a half minutes, White House just explodes out with possibly their most aggressive track to date by that point with a set of ranting lyrics that I can remember almost word for word. And that's where the real power of White House is located. The sounds are extreme. The rhythms and the textures can be really interesting but it's the vocal performances that really drive it. And I would suggest that White House, as a project, was instrumental on making these sort of like ranting monologues a central feature of the power electronic subgenre. White House kind of did it first, and I think they certainly did it best. Discussing White House lyrics would have to be a video in and of itself. Uh, if you start going down the rabbit hole as to what some of these songs are about, uh, where they're drawing some of the source material for the lyrics, it gets really fascinating. When you start realizing that the guys are uh, screaming lists of questions from uh, Scientology personality tests and stuff like that, you know, uh, repeating posts from pro anorexia forums in the mid 90s internet. Truly bizarre stuff that works in a, a sort of pastiche way by uh, displaying a lot of contrast in the specifics of the content, but really wanting to articulate how they're all deeply interrelated. And how they're most deeply interrelated is through their audience, through the act of consuming this material. Uh, White House, and Birdseed in particular, is sort of power electronics about the experience of consuming power electronics. So it's very meta, and it's very art school, and that might put some of you off. But don't worry, it's also the meanest shit in the universe. Uh, White House is a spectacularly cool band. I have not one but two tattoos dedicated to them on my body. Uh, but they're, they're, they're one of the coolest bands, uh, even within Power Electronics, simply because they are possibly the, the, the coldest and most heartless. Uh, it's not to say this isn't emotional music. It is, but the dominating emotion is a, a, a sheer uh, contemptuous rage. Uh, against uh, culture and society and the sort of inherent mendaciousness of all that. The title Birdseed uh, makes you think of consumption, and that's correct. And it might make you think of the victims of some of these stories being consumed by the sort of anti-hero perpetrators that form the first person in many of the lyrics, but that's not true. I think that what White House suggests is that the bird seed is the contents of the sort of salacious activities that are provided through the media to the audience for consumption. Uh, Peter Soto's uh, Abuse Soundtrack Collage is the title track of this record for good reason. 
a lot of people hate the title track off Birdseed. It is 14 and a half minutes that are very comparable to something like Peter Soto's uh, Buyer's Market. Essentially a collage of interviews with uh, victims of various kinds of physical or sexual abuse or sometimes the loved ones of murder victims giving public appearances, uh, you know, just sort of explaining their stories to the media. Um, in White House's world, and in Peter Soto's world, as he's clarified many times in several of his books, uh, since I'm a big fan of his writing, um, The Bird Seed is this content that is provided to the audience, which is us as well as college girls obsessed with true crime podcasts to uh, middle-aged people at home gasping at the newest revelation on, you know, whatever trashy reality TV show. We are all participating in this sort of uh, salacious need for sensational and lurid details about acts which paradoxically we're too afraid to commit ourselves you know i i think that when it comes to the the love of dark things or negative things however you want to phrase it being a bad guy recreationally um, there's a little bit of that at least in everyone but some people want to taste and some people want to eat the whole thing um white house is enraged by and obsessed with this activity of uh, performative victimhood over the uh, exploitation of the victimized to function as a sort of entertainment or in the world of Peter Soto as a sort of pornography uh, for these audiences. Uh, and they especially despise the way that it is draped in the sort of sanctimonious or safety-promoting wrapping uh, that news programs and daytime television and what have you provide. And this still goes on into the contemporary era through various sanctimonious YouTube and TikTok accounts that always know exactly how you should feel about everything. White House, as a project, and on Birdseed in particular, says fuck that, and just provides uh, intensely upsetting accusatory <laughs> accounts of uh, human cruelty. The opening two tracks are very distinct in their incredibly harsh and much more rhythmic than usual uh, production. Uh, Wriggle Like a Fucking Eel is another classic. The first two tracks off this album are the closest things that you could call uh, Power Electronics hit singles, as they're just pretty well known, even outside, especially when hip-hop group Clipping ended up sampling Wriggle Like an Eel for their song, Wriggle, appropriate title. Uh, anyway, White House's fascination with the depraved is interesting and distinct from both their earlier work and Sucliffe Jugend in that it comes from a position of uh, sort of sneering aristocratic contempt you know uh, a good feeling when you hear it in a uh, black metal record and also a good feeling here Sucliffe Jugend are down in the gutters um, you know uh, scraping change together to get a pint at the pub before sexually harassing women outside while covered in one's own vomit. White House would never stoop to that, or at least they would, you know, have the good sense to pay for the privilege. <laughs> White House see themselves as elite artists, uh, w which is just not a vibe that you really see in underground music anymore. Uh, you know, underground music, just due to its DIY reality or affectation, depending on how you look at it, uh, has become progressively more democratic and welcoming and uh, open-hearted over time. But White House belonged to an older school of catty, mean art school graduates who truly believe that bad art should be punishable by... I don't know, exile to Elba or something like that. So White House's uh, position when they are describing these lurid details and when they are also indicting you and, in a sense, themselves for uh, being personally obsessed with this salacious material, they do it from a position that still 
places themselves above the rabble of the public. Whether you think this is pretentious or not uh, doesn't really matter. I think that it is a sort of extra layer of the affect and the entire experience of uh, listening to White House as a project. White House don't just want you to feel bad about the content. They want you to feel bad about the part of you that likes the content. And they want you to feel bad and stupid that they are making fun of you at the same time. It's layers of negativity and layers of self, excuse me, self-referentiality that might strike a lot of people, honestly, as pretentious, and I get it. But, I don't know, maybe it's pretentious, but there's some depth to it. You can't accuse White House of not having thought out these processes. Um, the lyrics alone, much less the stuff they've said in interviews, indicates that these guys are indeed very serious thinkers. And that comes out in the content itself. As I was saying, the first two are bracing accusatory numbers, and the third track, Philosophy, is another infamous one that's a lot quieter and more minimal, but tracks the uh, sort of psychological processes and games of manipulation of a, uh, a wife beater. Uh, this is a uh, rework of a song with a longer title philosophy of a wife beater from a previous record. Uh, they're prone to uh, remixing and reworking their stuff, but I'd say the definitive versions of a lot of those tracks are found here on Bird Sea. Philosophy is horrible and kind of awesome in just how depraved it is. We get to Bird Sea, the massive collage of abuse. Uh, and getting back to that for a moment, again, this is an especially hated track. People say that it's boring, and yeah, of course it's supposed to be boring. It's supposed to be enervating. But the real quality of listening to 14 and a half minutes of, uh, you know, accounts of lurid abuse is that you listen to it and you're shocked, and then a few more minutes and you're bored, and then a few more minutes you start to get annoyed. And you start to resent the very voices that you hear. And then hopefully, before the end of it, a few more minutes in, you think to yourself, why are there so many of these accounts to draw from? Why are so many people making these public appearances where they're, where they're disclosing the absolute worst moments of their or a loved one's lives? Why was it so easy for Peter Sotos to create this sprawling mosaic of human misery with a bunch of testimony that was willingly given? Beyond that, the record sort of wraps itself up. Uh, Cut Hands Has the Solution is uh, another nice, driving, uh, nasty track. And uh, Munkisi Mankandi is a nice slab of harsh noise to round things out. What Burton Seed is, is really punchy. It's only six tracks. You know, the runtime isn't very long. The first two open just the way any opening couplet of a metal record should go. Then you get into deeper and darker territory, and then it doesn't overstay its welcome. But every one of the tracks on this album is not just so intense or so harrowing or uncomfortable, but so distinct and so precise. I think that's one of the big things about White House for me, is the precision of their attack and the invitation for you to look into those lyrics, to understand what these songs are about, to get wrapped up in the art world to really expand what you know and what you think about the nature of art and the nature of media beyond the immediate thoughts caused by listening to the record. Uh, it's a record and a band that causes you to do homework and to enjoy the process and to expand personally on how you understand the world around you. Um, they've been extremely influential to me and the way I think about Western society. And uh, I think if you give it a shot, there's 
There's a lot to dig out there for you too. Navicon Torture Technologies was among the first power electronics groups that I heard. Well, I say groups, although it's a uh, solo project by one man that goes by the name of Leech. Or at least it did. Uh, before he ended the project, started doing one called Theologian, and then not really sure what he's up to nowadays. Not really sure what's up with NTT nowadays either. Back in the late 2000s into early 2010s, a lot of people who enjoy noise and power electronics would sing this project's praises. But like a lot of bands that I like to talk about typically on this show, it seems like NTT has sort of disappeared from the public zeitgeist insofar as that exists for something like power electronics. Some of those records are pretty hard to find nowadays, too. Leach primarily put out his discography as limited edition pro CDRs on his own imprint. You know, had some compilation appearances, some assistance from labels, but for the most part it was sort of a DIY effort from the start and kind of ended the same way. Navicon Torture Technologies is pretty unique in the power electronics space. Um, while musically it might bear a passing resemblance to other power electronics, Everything else has been sort of rearranged. NTT, uh, especially in its later work, is centered around melody and tone color in a way that most power electronics groups don't have any interest in. There's still a lot of distortion and a lot of abrasion, but it tends to provide more of an enveloping, sort of softly suffocating atmosphere rather than a directly threatening one. And those tones, these small fragments of melody usually arranged into loops and underpinning entire tracks, uh, there's, there's something about it, this ghostly, fragile beauty. Even while blasted through ten layers of distortion, reverb, delay, what have you, those melodies always shine in this very distinct way. Now, they wouldn't pop up on every track, you know, uh, this is a project that's about high contrast, so there's a lot of more direct power electronics material across the discography. But these moments of intense, fragile melody, despite not making maybe the bulk of his work, are essentially the touchstone that all the material revolves around. You know, these... Uh, these, these crests of emotion where the project reveals its intent uh, at its most naked and sort of unburdened from expectation. Navicon Torture Technologies is leech in a way that most of these projects aren't. Uh, I'm sure that plenty of power electronics artists would say that their music is a full expression of themselves, and I'm sure that plenty would admit it's a, a heightening of one or two aspects of themselves. But in NTT's case, we can say that the project and the man are synonymous. Uh, it's, without a doubt, one of the most emotionally vulnerable and delicate power electronics projects out there, even if it's expressed with a sort of uh, ferocity and seemliness that befits anything in the genre. Leech was sad. Uh, unbelievably sad. And by listening to his discography, you really seem to get an insight into the very real person behind it. Because I think that much of his lyrics and many of the themes of his songs are just outpourings of sort of mm, slightly and in some cases probably not at all metaphorical real experience. I think that NTT of all the power electronics projects that I listen to is the one that I identify with the most personally. I can uh, perceive a lot of parallels in the way that uh, Leech feels about the world and about the people around him that I also feel. 
a lot of NTT's music, though phrased in the parlance of violence and very particularly fixated sexual pathology. Uh, even though it might be portrayed through those things, the core of the music's emotion is centered around a, a profound disconnection and a profound sorrow at an inability to connect with other people, which is something that over the course of my life, you know, I've felt a lot personally. So discovering this project in high school was kind of nice for me. I don't share all the same specific pathologies that Leech does. He is uh, fixated on uh, certain obsessive uh, sexual acts that uh, I don't necessarily have in common with him. But that core of longing surrounded by this sort of uh, contemptuous antagonism and uh, you know, petty cruelty is something that I could identify with. The record that we're covering here, Pure Skin, really sort of could have been picked out of a hat. I don't know what I would say the best NTT record is. It might be this one, it might be Church of Dead Girls, it might be Dripping with the Power of Her Flesh, it might be The Arrow and the Wound. There's a long discography, and a lot of it I still haven't heard because, again, a lot of these recordings are just lost to time unless you're on Soul Seek and searching for it at exactly the right point in time. Pure Skin, though, is probably his best known record, and it's a varied one which really covers all the bases of what the project intended to accomplish. So, even if it's not necessarily the best, it works as a skeleton key that can at least show off the project and let you know if you like it. And if you do, you can go elsewhere in the discography to find things more concentrated on the specific features that you really appreciate from this one. Uh, the opening track, The Stars and the Scars, is again a uh, near uh, Power Electronics hit single, uh, which really shows off the core of what makes this project so great. This incredibly slowly delivered, constantly shifting, elegiac, uh, ambient melody that underpins the entire song is just heartbreakingly beautiful. All these contrasting, meshing synth tones piling together to make something that sounds like, uh, I don't know, a, a, a nest of snakes writhing and glowing with bioluminescence. It's, it's very strange. Um, beyond that, though, you start to get into some of the other important features. The uh, spoken word samples. I'm not sure where the main one in this song comes from. It appears to be in Swedish, so if there's any Swedish listeners who want to analyze a power electronic song to find the film that it's from, uh, feel free and drop it in the comments. The samples of mostly just dialogue from films and not special dialogue, not dialogue that points to a specific reference, but usually just sort of like quiet, depressed, small talk. That combined with other sort of howling, occasionally uh, melodically employed uh, vocal samples. Uh, this is vocally driven music, and especially in Leach's vocal performance, uh, which is in the declarative style of power electronics, but even more broken and sad and roaring and so swathed in delay it becomes nearly impossible to decipher what he's saying. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to it, but on Leech's old website uh, that was for uh, Navicon Torture Technologies as well as the Annihilus uh, label or imprint that he ran for a while, uh, had the lyrics to all of his releases available, but I haven't been able to track that down in several years, so you'll have to take me at my word that Leech's lyrics are pretty outstanding. Um, there's a nearly gothic edge to them and how much they portray this sort of uh, obsessive, malignant yearning for connection with others. 
And it also manages to be savage and depraved and insane at the same time. Uh, it's not easy to make extreme art that also taps into more delicate emotions so effectively, but that's why this project is a personal favorite of mine. After the opening track, Pure Skin tends to bounce around a little bit with a couple tracks at a time of more straightforward antagonistic power electronics, and then suddenly granting you islands of melody, usually on longer tracks. The tone color is so distinct to this project. I don't think I've ever really heard that employed in this way in power electronics elsewhere. It's been a huge influence on me on the occasion that I do dip into ambient or power electronics territory on my own. And it's always struck me as a sort of gold mine of underutilized potential within the power electronic space. Does it shift the project a little bit away from what we might traditionally call power electronics? Sure. I mean, some people say that NTT is more of a hybrid of dark ambient and power electronics, but ultimately, who cares? He was using those techniques to create stuff roughly within the power electronic space that still stands to this day as extreme and beautiful and uniquely personal and affecting in a way that little power electronics is, but maybe only power electronics can be. If this is a long record, most NTT records are kind of endurance tests, but that is part of the idea. You know, the repetition of melodic motifs, the uh, lyrics that are constantly bellowing out in a sort of agonized frustration that's displaced through violence and sexual fantasy. You know, it gives the sort of horrible Groundhog's Day sense of a uh, series of interpersonal problems and probably mental illness that's just metastasized over the course of a man's life. You know, rendering him sort of fundamentally unable to communicate with people normally. You know, I guess the way I've always seen it is that, at least in terms of the character Leech is portraying here, he's depicting a man for whom he only has a hammer and so everything's a nail. That hammer being violence and aggression. It's interesting for a project to center so specifically on this sort of petty lashing out, uh, this sort of um, not weak-willed but emotionally stagnant place where a man divorced of all other options is forced to interact with all people in all situations with the same level of aggression just for want of other or better tools. This isn't uh, fun music by any stretch of the imagination, and I would say that this can put you in a pretty negative headspace if you're predisposed to that, but, you know, if you're a person like me who's inclined to take a sort of psychological bad trip within themselves on a semi-regular basis, this is a, a pretty good aid for that. GR by Death Pile is one of the best known power electronics records outside of the genre, and it's also one of the most divisive. Uh, Death Pile actually had a fairly long career of releases, but GR released in 2003, the project's final output, sort of erased its previous discography. Older Death Mile material is cool, but it's really just a sort of categorically lesser version of what's accomplished on this record. Uh, GR is difficult. The other three records that I've covered on this piece uh, have something to offer, even if you're not necessarily into power electronics itself. Uh, that is not the case for GR. If you wanted to build a stereotype in your mind uh, regarding what modern power electronics sounds like, it's pretty much this record. 
big beds of sort of crumbling, burbling, bass-heavy distortion with periodic screeching high feedback and uh, a man ranting about murdering prostitutes over the top of it covered in about 20 layers of distortion and reverb. It is minimal and aggressive and direct in the manner of uh, a lot of power electronics with a much lower profile than this one. But what GR offers is clarity of vision. Uh, previous death pile material has been, you know, extremely transgressive in the manner of power electronics. Uh, there was one record in 97 called Triumph of Death where uh, John Kennedy, the main man behind the project, used the uh, gore photo of a dead child, and uh, that upsets a lot of people. GR, though, is uh, really just sort of a historical artifact. Uh, GR is John Kennedy working through the story of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, uh, who is a serial killer who is responsible for probably upwards of 70 dead prostitutes uh, in a string of murders that starts in the early 80s and then moves, uh, you know, into the 90s but not too far. Ridgeway's murders were sort of fascinating for a couple of reasons and I can see why John decided to build an album around his story. One was the frequency, you know, when Gary started, he just didn't stop for a while. If you look up the uh, disappearance dates of his various victims, you can see periods where Gary was every week going down and finding someone new to kill, including sometimes on back-to-back -back days. It's completely crazy. The other thing is that Gary Ridgway wasn't a smart guy. Uh, psychologists uh, in prison assume that his IQ is probably in the low 80s. And that's what, uh, that's what GR really sounds like. It's stupid and angry and vicious. And through its sort of crass stupidity, it arrives at something that is, at least to me, sort of profound. This is a divisive record, partly because I just think a lot of normies ran into this album incidentally, or at least normies insofar as internet music geek people. And when you read them, uh, uh, when you read them writing reviews on this record on places like Rate Your Music, uh, you'll see a big division between people that really appreciate this for what it is and people who really hate it calling it sort of like stupid or funny, crass and misogynistic, and it is all those things. But you'll notice that the diction with which these people write these reviews is sort of unnecessarily hostile in an interesting way. Uh, they're angry at this album. They are insisting that they just find it funny and absurd, but... Their anger indicates that they're experiencing a sort of panic when they talk about it. Something has gotten under their skin about this. Whenever somebody is telling you how not angry they are, that's how you can be sure that they're very, very mad in the manner of Mr. Rogers. So what is it that upsets people so much? Well, I don't think anyone thinks that John Kennedy is really personally identifying with Ridgeway on this. Uh, I mean, by the time this came out, you know, the Green River killer had already been in jail for a while, and there just really wasn't a whole lot to it. But I think that it's the willingness to just explore something genuinely repellent. And not just to explore it, but to explore it without any judgment or any interest in creating some sort of morality play around it. 20 years on from this record, mainstream culture is just packed to bursting with morality plays. With, uh, you know, art, which is always supposed to tell you how to think and feel about things. And GR doesn't do that. It allows you to make your own judgments. I mean, I think John Kennedy can assume that you believe that uh, Ridgeway was 
Batman, in the words of Norm MacDonald, a real jerk. But he doesn't have any interest in dwelling on the topic. And moreover, he inhabits a first person perspective trying to navigate the sort of uh, fractured psyche of a person that would do this. And he does it in a way that is compelling and vicious. The minimalism of this record uh, means that it was probably done fairly quickly, but it was time well spent. The noise on this is all enveloping, almost more like a harsh noise wall than you might expect from a Power Electronics record, but it's consuming and fragmented and soaks up frequency space in a way that I find really compelling. It's droning, but it never becomes tiring or repetitive. And the minor fluctuations between tracks cause the listener to start paying more attention to the actual contours of that noise. You know, you could argue that this is a record where every track sounds the same, and that's, which is essentially just true. You know, essentially every track on this sounds the same, and most of these tracks are so short and to the point it sort of doesn't matter what order you listen to them in if you don't mind breaking up the narrative. But it's all about the subtle shades of difference between um, the slowly shifting textures. It's sort of like when I talk about brutal death albums that are so dense from artist to artist it becomes difficult to tell the difference unless you're particularly invested in the style. Same thing applies here. The process of listening to this from beginning to end is harrowing and simultaneously meditative. And it's surprisingly easy to slip into the mindset of the main character here. John Kennedy's vocal performance is so convincing that you end up feeling the sort of like bizarre righteous anger that defined a lot of his crimes. You know, uh, Gary Ridgway <laughs> said his crimes. Ridgway's crimes. You see, the, the subject and the object start to merge after a certain point. Ridgway always talked about this uh, overwhelming hatred of prostitutes as well as this sort of obsessive addiction to them. And the record kind of conveys that through its single-minded intensity, this object of fixation that it just can't pull itself away from, no matter what sort of attempts are made. So the minimal repetitive quality of this really does get you in the mindset of this minimal repetitive serial killer who constantly recreated the same situations over and over again seeking a satisfaction that never really arrived. I like GR so much for its purity. In some ways I would say that GR is a record that maybe more than anything else defines modern power electronics. You could imagine this record being the very first power electronics record or the very last in some sense uh, on this record Kennedy arrived at a sound and an execution that was so direct and so fundamentally irreducible that it just it, it breathed life into the style uh, for me power electronics sort of centers around this record as its anchor it might not be the best, but it is, without question, in my mind, the most defining. And I think that the sort of relentless provocation of this music, as well as on the other records that we've covered, is really central to appreciation of this genre. As I said earlier, you know, the other records that I covered on this episode have something to offer people outside of power electronics. But... In the same way that you can't really say you like black metal just because you like the best material by Mayhem or Emperor, you can't say you really like power electronics if you don't like at least a few records that sound like this. You know, this is the pure sound of the style. Irreducible, minimal, and direct. In the same way that if you like black metal and you pick a record up off the shelf that has uh, an inverted cross and a black and white cover. In the same way that you're probably going to like that, you would probably like GR. 
the cruelty and force with which this music projects itself is truly amazing. And when I listen to it, I feel a sort of ferocity directed at the culture around me. Uh, I read the reviews of this record that are so plaintive and whining and trying to posture as though they're too cool to find this spooky. And uh, it, it sort of drives me insane, you know? <laughs> I mean, you can take a style of music and refuse to engage with it and say that you won because it didn't affect you, but I don't really know how much of a reward that is for consuming art. Or you can choose to sort of meet it in the middle, meet it on its own terms and experience what was intended. But the funny thing is, all those people who are decrying this record as just obnoxious, uh, antagonistic bullshit, I think are actually experiencing as intended. That tension that they're experiencing, that, uh, that need to distance themselves from it psychologically and emotionally, tells me that this is a record that does exactly what it says that it's going to do, you know, regardless of whether you agree with it or not. This one's been a big influence on me. Uh, not just musically, but in terms of the sheer will and the, the force that it suggests. It's not a record about subtle shades of emotion. It's not a record about nuance. It's a record about power and control and domination and a sort of heady meanness that I've only ever found in some of the most extreme, brutal death outside of this genre. Um, it's a great record, and it doesn't really matter if you think it is or not, because the power that it holds genuinely does speak for itself.